Welcome to the Longest Day podcast. I'm Leah, your host and the founder of Broadstairs Consulting. We help rebuild relationships and facilitate effective dialogue. We are convinced that people matter and that conversations count. So we started The Longest Day, a series of conversations where we learn from the resilience, determination, and candor of our guests. As they look back on their longest days, our hope is that it will empower you to look forward. We hope their stories will be a part of shaping yours. This week on The Longest Day is Leah Wilkinson, a former Welsh international field hockey player. She retired as Wales captain and from Team GB with 204 international caps, of which 183 were for Wales and 21 for Great Britain. Leah holds the title of Wales' most capped sportsperson and featured in an impressive four Commonwealth Games and countless European championships. She took over the captaincy of her country in 2018. Leah made her debut for Great Britain on the 1st of October 2019 and subsequently won a bronze medal at the 2021 Tokyo Olympics. She continues to play domestic club hockey for Surbiton in the Premier Division of the Vitality Women's Hockey League. Leah works at a mixed independent school in Surrey where she teaches history, and she and I met at Repton over 20 years ago. Well, it goes without saying that I really, really, really enjoy interviewing people that I've known for a really long time. (laughs) So it is such a privilege to have Leah Wilkinson on The Longest Day. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me. I'm really excited to to be here and to talk about my longest day. So thank you for inviting me. Oh, no, no worries at all. I'm guessing it's probably going to be hockey related. Why don't you tell our listeners about your longest day? <laughs> um, yeah, actually, it's a bit of an anticlimax now. But yeah, no, definitely um, it, it's it's hockey related. I think for me, my longest day is the day in, in, in 2016 when I got the email through from the coach of Great Britain at the time to say that I hadn't got picked for the the Great Britain squad that was building up to Tokyo. I think it was such a, a wake up call because, you know, the, the two previous Olympics, so both London um, and Rio, I, um, I don't know, I, I thought I could have gone and, um, and it, I had been injured. I had been a bit complacent in, in London 2012. Um, I was at Loughborough at the time. I'd just come out of Repton and where obviously I met Ilya. Um, and I, you know, with London, I thought, oh, I, I kind of thought, oh yeah, I can do this with this kind of 19 year old swagger, uh, which kind of let me down. And then by Rio, um, I'd kind of had a couple of opportunities for trials and had got some injuries, which meant that I kept basically not being able to go to the trials when I was invited. So when I finally got to be able to be invited in, in 2016 post Rio, where obviously they won the gold medal, um, I was ready and raring to go, not injured in much better head headspace obviously more mature and uh, a little bit more realistic um and I went for three weeks I took a kind of three weeks off work at the time uh, I was teaching took three weeks off went you know gave my all and it's it's blowing hard you know these three weeks of really really intense hockey trials to try to get this one well limited spots on a kind of full-time funded UK sport funded position within the GB squad and I thought I did okay. And then an email comes and says, unfortunately, you hadn't been selected. And for me, it was such a blow because honestly, it was 10, 10 years of trying to get picked. Um, and I'd actually played at that point for Wales for 11 years already. So I'd already played, you know, a hundred times for Wales. And it was such a blow. Um, and it was such a, I felt so deflated. Um, and, you know, it was a real difficult one because on that day I was absolutely gutted. But actually, it's also been that the irony has probably actually made and gave me the opportunity to then play for Great Britain a few years later because it, it kind of took this weight off my shoulders in the end. A few weeks later, I realised, you know what, I'm just going to reflect on what I've achieved with Wales and where I was as a person and actually by taking that pressure off myself, though that was the longest and hardest day, it actually ended up resulting in 
that pressure going and playing so much better because when the coach came, I wasn't like, oh, the coach is here. And, you know, it, it made me play better. And actually it allowed me to get a second opportunity a few years later, which led me obviously to being able to go to the Tokyo Olympics and obviously win that medal. So it was definitely a wake up call, but sometimes those hardest days do result in some of the best outcomes it's just the resilience and the ability to bounce back from those moments and if you can do that well um I think then actually you often get better results in the end it's just the way you bounce back when did you first fall in love with hockey oh when I was five I first picked up a stick my parents uh, my parents both played so to be honest it was very much the drag drag me and my sister down to the side of the hockey pitch so we didn't get really get much choice so um you know it would just be there with a little stick banging on the side of the pitch watching the parents play and then I realized that it was a pretty cool sport fast and you know fierce and I, at this point I know that people some people are going to be like this no the hockey's not cool the hockey is awful I remember cold hands and broken shins which is what a lot of people say to me I definitely think it's it's a little bit of a marmite sport but um yeah I love I loved it and um tried to play multiple sports at the same time um as I got older but as many people know it's difficult in whatever walk of life to do lots of different things to the best of your ability so yeah, um, I only focused on hockey then really from the age of kind of 14, 15, rather than judo and football and everything else that I tried to fit in. But yeah, from a young age, that's for sure. So the passion that you have for the sport, together with your personality, has created this determination to succeed and to keep pushing yourself. Who did you have around you when you experienced that setback of your longest day? Who was it who encouraged you to pick up the stick and keep fighting? I think, to be honest, it, it, it was a lot. It's a selection of lots of different people. So, you know, my my mum and dad had always been supportive of me from a young age. But in that regard, that they never really put pressure on me. Um, you know, to I suddenly... I remember one day playing for Wales and being to lots of different tournaments and Commonwealth Games and thinking, well, actually, I've never had somebody really push me to do that. They've just been supportive. And I think it was very much like that. I remember my mum saying, well, you know, we've tried, look where you are, look what you've achieved, you know, and she always wanted me to get that great beat Britain cap because she felt that it's something that I deserved and it'd be really nice to have. And I think she was very supportive in because normally she's quite stern. She was very supportive in, in saying, you know, well, you've done all you can. You, you know, you, you've, you've tried to achieve it. And, you know, maybe now it's a good idea to kind of just reflect on where you're at, you know, and things like that. And I also think it was my teammates around me, you know, I obviously was playing uh, club hockey as well and playing for Wales and it was really nice and comforting to go back to those safe places those places where I felt that I played my best hockey and I was surrounded by people of a common interest and a common goal and almost having that security blanket of my safe place made me remember again that um why I love the sport and don't get me wrong it's not always good to go back to that safe place and that security blanket but sometimes when you're you know, at a low point and a difficult point, it's really nice. So I definitely think my family and also having that security of my teammates around me really, really helped. Mm -hmm. And obviously, to be honest, myself, I think I'd got through quite a few setbacks with injuries and with not getting picked before that I, I think that I've picked up quite a good toolbox of, of tricks and skills of how to bounce back and I think sport especially has done that for me not just not getting picked for things but losing losing games you know not doing well not playing personally well and having that toolbox of kind of resilience and and kind of grit it gave me the skills to be able to also bounce back myself and kind of do self-talk and positive reflections on, on myself and I think that's really important that you have to have people around you, but also I think it's really important that you have to have skills within yourself to be able to help yourself kind of stick yourself back together. Yeah, absolutely. And elite sport is renowned for being a roller coaster, particularly when you're coming back from injuries. 
As you progress through your career, being selected for the GB team going to the Olympics, what was it that kept you grounded? I think the sport itself, for a start, keeps you grounded in the nicest possible way. We're not talking um, professional footballers here. I'm not sitting in my 10-bedroom mansion with my Rolex is on. So actually, in a way... That kept me grounded. Whilst I was still in the Great Britain programme, I was still teaching one... I was full-time, but I chose to go and teach in the school that I had been working at one day a week because I wanted that sense of normality. And there's nothing like children, let's be honest, to keep you grounded. <laughs> there's nothing like um, telling, you know, kids to hand in their homework. So um that definitely helped. And I think it was important, one... Yeah, like I say, hockey helped because I wasn't raking in the money. Um, and unfortunately for me, you know, hockey's not on a TV enough and media enough anyway. So it was not like there was that pressure as such of, you know, oh, how am I going to spend my first million? Um, and then the second side of it was I tried to just continue as normal. So, you know, my same friends and my same family, um, the, the same school that I worked at, I just kept that going. Um, obviously not the same with the work, but as much as possible, because I think if you, like you said, if you can keep grounded, it really enables you to focus on why you were there in the first place and to get the best performance because your head's still on the hockey pitch and your head's still on being the best athlete, not on other outside distractions. And you see it all the time in professional sport. You know, um, I was watching a documentary the other day on Boris Becker at 17, um, becomes Wimbledon champions, gets lots of money and then performance decreases same with professional footballers all the time um and lucky enough I didn't have those those pressures to the same regard um so that that really helped but yeah I mean being grounded in elite sport can of, often be a challenge well-being you know the facts things are worse than ever burnout trauma absence attrition Leaders are tired of the empty gesturing about mental health. Leaders are resigned to ticking boxes, obliged to throw money away on medically flimsy, temporary solutions that have failed workforces. Adagio VR is the culmination of decades of work by a fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Partners of the NHS and Oxford University, this is the world's first ever virtual reality program using clinical therapeutics accessible anywhere. Take meaningful action. Remove the need to cope. Adagio VR. I've often wondered whether athletes feel the pressure of the media when reporting on whether this is going to be the match that this player um, achieves the most capped player. And I know that so many of the headlines around your achievements were framed in that way. How did you keep the main thing the main thing? I, I, I think it's a really... It's a really good question to, to ask about, you know, how, how to continue to focus when you have external, uh, yeah, you know, writings about you or targets or aims. And honestly, I just played. I think fundamentally, I'm still that five year old kid that picked up that hockey stick. And even now at 37, coming to the end of my hockey playing career, I still have that buzz when I get, get to the pitch. I mean, don't get me wrong, not so much when it's cold and wet anymore, but I think that's the thing when you get uh, rewards or there's pressures to win trophies or individual recognition for certain things. I think for me, I was able to just focus on, I love this sport. And whenever I get on a pitch, I still am that competitive 16, 18 year old that I was. And I wish that I wasn't old in the sporting world because I still get that buzz now. And when I became the most capped Welsh athlete, you know, I, I just had played hockey. I just loved hockey and I just stuck around because I loved it and it happened. I know that sounds silly, but I just played more times than anyone else because I loved the sport. Um, and I think that that's why. And I think that passion and that you have for the sport is so important because, you know, before I played for Great Britain, when I was just playing for Wales, I was getting up at half five in the morning to train on a school playing field before going to teach a full day of lessons, before going to the gym in the evening. And if you don't have that passion for the sport, you're not going to do that for very long. Um, 
So yeah, I was just lucky that along the way I got some, you know, recognition at times and I got the, the rewards, um, and, and the cap kind of record. Um, but that happened as a natural progression for just loving hockey. As you look back over your whole hockey career, is there anything that you wish that you had done differently? When I joined Repton, um, so, you know, at sixth form, so I was 16, 18 years old, and in my early years of Loughborough University, both incredible places to have opportunities to really succeed and have real ambition in sport. And I think at that time, I, like I said, my family hadn't really pushed me. I didn't really know what I wanted. I just liked hockey. Uh, and I think when I look back, I wish that at that age, from kind of 16 to 20, I had taken those opportunities. And I think, you know, there was players at, at school whilst I was, you know, at the, at the, grubber the tuck shop or wherever you know or in our houses in our houses yeah they were training on the pitch and I was just socializing or when I went to Loughborough and I probably to be honest enjoyed myself a little bit too much in my first year they were doing extra training sessions and actually I think that if I had really tried hard there and really trained then maybe I might have been able to get into that London 2012 team and I think that would have opened a whole different um, pathway with with getting to play for GB much earlier and potentially going to three four Olympics and achieving more in my sport and even potentially becoming a better player because I would have had more support earlier so I think that's the one bit I kind of regret and wish I'd done is by yeah focusing and being I would just wish I'd been more focused at that age but it's hard to regret isn't it because I look back and I've achieved lots of different things and I had a great time at uni and I had a great time at school but there's always that what if I hadn't been that you know that big fish in that little pond and I'd stepped out and gone to join Leicester Hockey Club rather than staying at Loughborough who played in a different league and what was if I'd gone to the gin rather than drinking gin let's be honest you know it was those kind of things so I think that would be my biggest what if. It's an interesting point you raise though and it's actually something that funnily enough I'm talking to Repton about because there's something about having the drive and the potential and having people see both of those things in you and still not knowing or being equipped with what you need to take the next step. Did you have a mentor through those years or a coach who was particularly priming your interests to propel you forwards? Or were you very much navigating that formative period on your own? Oh, definitely, definitely the latter. I was definitely navigating by myself. And I think that obviously your parents, well, my parents were there to support me, but for them, it was not about trying to make this child that went to the Olympic Games or went to, you know, be a high performance sport. They were just supporting me by taking me to places and, you know, paying for my match fees, kind of thing like that. And actually, I think in sport now, I think there is more support available for, for youngsters. There's more mentoring. There's more sports psychology. There's more, uh, as a whole, um, more kind of development programs. Whereas for sure, uh, uh, when I was younger at that age, it was kind of self navigation and also, you know, just going on a pitch and seeing how good you could get really. I don't remember anybody saying, you know, you, you could play for Great Britain until probably 2010, 2011. So, um, just right before London. And at that point, it was obviously too late to really push myself to actually realistically get there. Uh, and even then, that was one coach saying, you've got the potential to play, which was a bit of a wake up call. Ooh, do I? Oh, oh, okay. You know, so that was very much like that. But yeah, there wasn't, but I do think there is more available in sport now. Um, and, you know, there's typically more funding pots put towards mentoring and sports that support. But I do also think it's really important not to push children too early, um, to guide them and to let them see their potential, but not to be too pushy because that's when I think you get results of 
anything from kids just not enjoying a sport anymore because there's too much pressure, all the way through, unfortunately, to mental health issues, eating issues, and all of those things that come with pushing children too early in sport if they're not ready or you don't give them the kind of scaffolding around it to to be able to um, achieve their goals. You've recently had, can I call it a Commonwealth leadership appointment? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) What do you want your legacy to be? Uh, I think... Oh, it's such a such a good question when to ask about legacy. Um, when we were in the GB programme, we always talked about this idea of kind of leaving your shirt in a better place. And I think I always question what exactly that looked like. But I think, you know, for me, it is about trying to inspire children to pick up a stick. Uh, and that's really important for me. You know, when you go onto a hockey pitch and you see the kids' faces light up um, because they're getting to meet someone that played international hockey. It's, it's an incredible feeling. And actually, that was the main reason more than anything that I wanted to win an Olympic medal. And I know it sounds really silly, but actually, you know what kids like. They want things to see and to hold. And actually, I remember um, just before that Olympic third place match thinking it'd be so amazing to be able to go around and visit clubs and to go back to my club and to see my nieces etc and be like here you go this is an olympic medal and that that for me kind of showed where I was in my in my career and what hockey had given me um and what I could give back was, you know, just by having something that I knew would mean so much to small children. And that's my biggest thing is to to be able to speak to schools, to be, speak to children and kind of inspire the next generation. I think that is how I want my legacy to be. I, to be honest, for me, it's not about, oh, that's that person that still has the most caps or that's that person that went to four Commonwealth Games. It's that person that inspired my child to pick up a stick or or to do anything and I always whenever I speak to children I always kind of I'm not trying to make them play hockey (laughs) or whatever I just give I just give messages of um you know what I've learned so they can do anything if it's music if it's art if it's sport anything to follow their dreams um and it's going to be really hard and there's going to be opportunity uh, there's going to be opportunities and there's going to be difficult times and I think for me, it's just been able to spread that message of having that ability to bounce back and to keep going. And actually failure is not a bad thing if you learn from it. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's what I want. I want to really inspire the next generation to, to get stuck in. I love that. Last question. If you had to live your longest day again, what food would you choose to fuel it? Oh, oh, pizza. Definitely. Oh, didn't even miss a heartbeat. <laughs> it, it would help, wouldn't it? Let's be honest. On a on a difficult day, a nice pepperoni pizza in front of you, sourdough crusts with a bit of chili oil. In fact, it sounds like I've been thinking about this a long time, and you haven't just asked me. <laughs> I'd have a a pint of Coke Zero, no ice, no lemon, with a nice pepperoni pizza, and that that would get me through. And or put me to sleep, to be honest, uh, on a on a bit of a uh, a carb carb come down. But yeah, um, definitely a pizza. My favourite thing in all the interviews we've had for the longest day so far, we have not yet had a repeat food choice. So your pepperoni pizza is banked. And yes, I know it's nine thirty in the morning, but I think I can just about get my head around that. <laughs> Leah, thank you so much for sharing your experiences, for sharing yourself. And I'm really excited to see how you manage to achieve that legacy. I'm absolutely sure that you will. And it's been really, really great to see you again. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, it's been fantastic. You've been listening to a Broadstairs Consulting Limited podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Tune in soon to hear the next instalment of The Longest Day. Copyright 2024, production copyright, Broadstairs Consulting Limited, all rights reserved. <laughs>